All right, today I'm really thrilled to be joined by Henrik Fexius, who wrote The Art of Reading Minds, How to Understand and Influence Others Without Them Noticing. How are you doing today, Henrik? Hi, how are you? I'm fantastic, and what I love about what you've written is I follow a lot of body language, Mm-hmm. But I also see your background gets into a lot of different things that I think are all in a spectrum. Mm-hmm. As an example, I think that body language, negotiation, persuasion, all the way to marketing and all the way back to mind control are of the same. It's just a spectrum of how many or how little and throw oh, hypnosis I, in there too. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, and it's just words, right? Because uh, from my point of view, uh, persuasion is the same thing as communication because you can't, or or influence at least, Mm -hmm. because you can't communicate anything to anyone without in some way trying to influence them, I suppose. I mean, even if you just say hi to someone, you're going to have a specific mannerism the way I just did. You're going to smile, you're going to look me in the eyes because you want to influence them to get a positive experience and greet you in a positive way back. So influence and communication, basically the same thing, or maybe just to get someone to understand you, that's influence as well. So, and what's the difference between influence and persuasion then? I don't know, is there a difference? So I, I completely agree. I think all, all of these things are just different aspects of uh, interpersonal communication, really. It's funny, I, I guess so in persuasion and influence, and you can see if you like my theory, I think of influence as a result and persuasion is a tactic. Right. Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, in, in, in Swedish, which is my first language, mm-hmm. uh, we only have one word for it. Oh, really? We, like a different, yeah. That's interesting, because I feel like there are different connotations. For example, manipulation and mm-hmm. persuasion. Manipulation is a very loaded term in English. Yeah. It is, and we have that word as well, but you have to understand that it's loaded, but not necessarily uh, from anything, from a good cause. Or, I mean, to manipulate something, it is just to change something from state A to state B, right? Mm-hmm. That is you having manipulated something. Right. Uh, it's a, a change of state. That doesn't say that it's good or that it's bad. Mm-hmm. It is just being able to to uh, create a change of state. That's why it's very neutral. But it mm. has been used in so many uh, ways where it gets the this negative association. So now we have a negative asso- association or connotation with the word. But that is just, you know, some sort of cultural baggage. It's not in the word itself. It's not in the action itself. That's interesting. Right. Is it is it possibly because of manipulating, like you can manipulate an object or mold a clay, yeah. Um, but that's an external, like you are doing it to something or someone versus right. persuasion where you are hopefully persuading them to take an action on their own. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's right. a degree of force? Maybe. Also, I think it's, um, there's a hidden premise. And that is that this is something that is being done uh, without, maybe against their will, right. or at least without them being aware of it. And that's the, the dark side of it. But that that is not in the words themselves. That is the way it can be. But for me, that is how to misuse it. That That's the, uh, uh, the wrong way to use it, the bad way. Uh, right. Because for every every tool, there's there's a good way and a bad way uh, of of using them, of course. But I think that we we are so concerned with the way it could be misused, so that gets the whole the whole uh, definition of the word. Sure. Uh, because it, well, I suppose if you manipulate something, I, I suppose that you you don't really care whether that object or that person is aware of it or not. If they want to do it or not. So I suppose uh, I can see why it's construed as a very negative thing, but it doesn't have to be, of course. Uh, I sure. mean, nudge, you, you're aware of nudging, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what is that? That is manipulating, but True. in a good way. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and, and truthfully, okay, you're a mentalist. You've been called the uh, Darren Brown of Sweden. Right. That's a pretty, hey, that's a pretty awesome comparison. I mean, Darren Brown has you know quite a lot of weight and clout. Yeah, but 
I would say that you're in your act, you are probably absolutely having to manipulate people. But everybody knows that they paid a fee. I mean, they yeah, paid exactly. for the privilege. The it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's perfectly fine. It's for entertainment, etc. Yeah. But I fear that, and you probably agree that some of those same tactics I've also had on cult expert um, Rick Allen Ross mm -hmm. are used to literally indoctrinate people. Either... Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that it is a good thing. <laughs> I'm just saying that it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. Right. But but absolutely. I mean, we can we can do terrible things to each other using the same technique. And this is this is why I find this whole thing so fascinating and also a bit mm -hmm. scary because the the techniques that we can use to really hurt uh, each other are basically the same things that we are already using in our everyday communication. We're just using them a bit more uh, focused, I should say, right. uh, and being aware of what what it is we're doing and what result we will get. But I mean, the uh, the difference in in the thing we actually do is not that great from what all the things that we put each other through every single day. And that is for me both fascinating and quite disturbing that I can use the same words or the same psychological mechanisms to just talk to you or really really hurt you. Yeah, you brought that up in the book, as a matter of fact, and I thought that was really cool, about one tactic for manipulating people is using the word not. Right. You're not feeling ill right now because that would be really terrible for your stomach to be hurting, and jeez. And people are doing this, and they don't even know necessarily that they are doing it. Right. So do you want to talk about that? Because I love the idea, oh, don't love, but I'm very interested in the idea of how people can inadvertently cause things to happen and they don't even know they're doing it. It's not an intentional or deliberate thing. Right, so so the thing about the word not uh, is that it's an, a negation, of course, uh, which uh, as a construct is an abstract thing. Mm -hmm. you, you can't go out and find that in reality. But what you can, can find is basically every, everything else. So. Uh, so if we hear a sentence using the word not, mm -hmm. brain, ha first it has to really make sure that we understand all the other things about that sentence before it could add on the negation. The classical example, of course, is do not think of a blue polar, polar bear. Now, right. the instance I say that you will, of course, think of a blue polar bear sure. because your brain will first check that you know what that is mm -hmm. and then then, oh, right, I was supposed not to. <laughs> so that means, of course, that if you tell someone that, um, uh, if someone asks you the way, and you say that, oh, it, uh, it's not very hard to find, your brain will understand the concept of it being hard to find, mm -hmm. and it will start to think back to all the times you, you had a hard time finding something. So it will... Uh, release all those associations in that state of mind and mm. then try to slip that knot onto it. But the association has already been made, which means, of course, that uh, that will be so much stronger than something that is just a semantic uh, thing, the word not. I mean, for instance, if someone is, uh, what's the word for it? If you know, if you're if you're sitting on a chair and you're 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 tilting the, the chair, I suppose, uh, on the back legs of the chair, um, What's, what do you call that? Is there a word for it? What, tilting for it? backward? Um, if you say don't yeah, fall. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so if you say someone, uh, do not tilt backwards on the chair. Right. They will, will tilt backwards on the chair. But if you say, uh, please sit up straight. Uh, that's much easier because that's, that's all something that I can understand. So using this, we can put images emotions and thoughts into other people's heads by just saying that it is not so. That uh, makes sense. Absolutely. So um, are you, for instance, are you a uh, are you a sober person or are you not drinking? Mm. Completely different images in, in your head, right? right? One is a drink, except not. And the other one is still a sober person. I guess um, occasionally so, that might be good, though, if somebody you want them to be a non-smoker versus yeah, a, a, a former smoker. I, 
I'm not saying that you can never use the word not. Sure, sure, uh, yeah. But again, the word non-smoker. Now, that is uh, an interesting example because that is actually in itself sort of a label. Right. But it's still the focus on the action smoking. I mean, when... when <laughs> That's when, why uh, I brought it up. <laughs> it's... Uh, Richard Nixon said, I am not a crook. Right. Everyone heard the word crook. Why didn't he say, I'm an honest person? Right. Right? That would have been so much better. Instead uh, of no, I love that. It, image of a crook. I love that. And it actually comes into marketing, too. I'm I'm, I'm friends with uh, Christopher Lockhead, who is into category, category creation. And he mm -hmm. rails about the Pepsi challenge. And right. everybody there. Now, lately, they've been doing it again. Them, somebody yeah. goes in the restaurant and says, I'd like a Coke. Oh, we have Pepsi. Is that good enough? What? What do you mean? Pepsi is blah, 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 blah. And he's like, those stupid idiots. Every time they say that, what are you thinking? Coke. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, and here's another great, great, uh, another great reason uh, why you should avoid the word not. Uh, there's a couple of different reasons for it, just to make you a better person, I think. Mm. Uh, the first one is that it's very, it's a lazy way of expressing yourself. It's very easy to say what you don't want to. It's much harder to say what you actually want um, because that means that you have to be creative and you have to uh, formulate your own goals and so on. But that is very good for you for, as a mental exercise. What do I actually want? Uh, for instance, I'm so tired of hearing people saying that, oh, uh, my new boyfriend, uh, I don't want him to be as the last one. Mm. Well, how do you want him to be? I don't care as long as he's not like that. But yeah. if we're only backwards and not forwards, we will end up in the ditch. Uh, but also, here's the thing. We do actually get the thing we ask for uh, much more than we than we know. Uh, that was a strange sentence. I'll try to rephrase this. No, so a lot of times when we ask for something, we... We use the word not in a way that it sort of we shoot ourselves in the foot. I did a very interesting experiment where where I had this girl going into a cafe and mm -hmm. the cafe had, as a rule, it was a chain, a chain of cafes. They're all over. The, our Starbucks, basically. Okay. And the rule was if you bought an ordinary coffee, like an, uh, a filter coffee, you, you would not get a small piece of chocolate. But if you bought an espresso based coffee, Hmm. They also threw in a, a, a bit of chocolate with that coffee. Hmm. That was their thing because coffee is supposed to go with espresso. I don't know. So anyway, uh, so we did an experiment where she went to a couple of cafes and we filmed her with hidden cameras. Mm -hmm. And she bought an, a regular coffee and, and she said, um, I can't get one of those as well, can I? And they said, no, you can't. Uh, and... And then we just changed the expression. She didn't get any chocolate at all. And then mm. we just changed the wording. And she again went out, she bought her coffee and she said, can I get one of those as well? And they said, yeah, of course, of course you can have one. <laughs> now, so the interesting thing here is that both times they actually complied with her request. Mm. They didn't mm -hmm. deny her the first time. She said, I cannot get one of those, right? And they said, no, you can't. You're right, you can't. And the second time she said, uh, I can get one of those, right? Yes, you can. Of course you can. That's so, so funny. So both times she actually got what she asked for. That makes sense. My wife rails about that too. She's a library director and she right. can't stand it when people come up to her and say, you don't have fill in the blank. Right. And she's like, why are you asking me a negative? Yeah. I know what it should be. Right. Do you have blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, so a lot of the times when we don't get the result we want, maybe we should think about our own wording. What did I ac actually ask for? Did I ask for it or did I ask not for it? Have you, um, I think you've mentioned that you've read Cialdini, right? Influence? Yeah. Okay. He, he goes into that a bit with the word because. Right. As a tool where there was a copier experiment where people right, would right. go in and they'd say, yes, I yes. have to make uh, copies. Yes. And can I go, you know, can I cut in line? Yeah. Because and, I have to make copies. Uh, yeah. And it literally it was that because I have to make copies. And it was like 96% of the time they let them yeah. do it. So it, it, that makes me think of the experiment you just ran a little bit where people just kind of will go with it. 
Yeah, because we we do we prefer to say yes to other people most of the time, but we don't want to look stupid. And in his, his experiment, all they needed was an excuse or a reason for them to say yes. They could ask something, and as long as they were provided a reason, however uh, stupid that reason was, uh, that was fine. So yeah. Well, and while we're on that, because I I love that you know having a positive connotation and things like that. Mm. You talk a good bit about um, opinion Aikido. Right. And I would love to explore that a little bit because I feel like that that is the same thing, kind of a mindset principle of of taking a concept and having a positive spin on it or reframing it. Would that be fair? That is just a wonderful tool where I suppose it's a bit sneaky and could be construed as, as not being so nice, but uh, so so the this is a tool for when you, for instance, meet angry people, and you need to defuse them, uh, and uh, and you can't find anything to agree upon with them. Maybe you think that they're completely in the wrong. Uh, there's no reason for them to be as excited, but mm -hmm. still, what you all the time, what, what you have to do if if you want someone to listen to you you first have to find some common ground. You have to build some sort of relationship with them. Uh, even if it's an angry person, they need to feel that you are in some respect on your on their side, or at least they they understand where, where you are and where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. A beautiful little sentence, which is that just that, uh, I, I understand your reactions completely. If I were you, I would have, I would have done exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, always a trivial truth because if you were them <laughs> that's you would have done what they are doing right well, yeah but literally not, yeah but that's not what it sounds like because when you hear that you feel like oh here's someone who actually understands me maybe this is someone i should listen to as well so that's a very very effective way of, of very quickly finding some sort of rapport or, or common ground uh with someone who's just going off on the on on something and I but I do recommend that as a last resort it's better of course if you can build your relationship on true understanding sure. or uh, discussing this properly but if, if nothing else works I understand exactly why your reaction if I were you I would understand the same thing <laughs> well I've had on um, uh, police negotiators uh, hostage and FBI negotiators and I know um, like J Paul Nadeau has talked about how that kind of technique just by itself with a suspect yeah sometimes you're the only person who has ever actually listened to them at all yeah that could be the difference between getting a confession or having somebody out there doing more crime mm. so i i think it's a, a very powerful tool and I, I like how you you put it in that manner now you kind of continue to talking about the EAC model, which I believe right. is the yes. um, I accessing cues. Mm -hmm. That's all so NLP, this, right? What? That's out of NLP. It is. And um, there's a lot of misunderstandings going on about that. Mm -hmm. So the EAC model was um, the way I understood it when I read Richard Bandler and uh, John Griner was, of course, that they had an idea that when we think, or rather they have had observed that when we think we tend to move our eyes mm -hmm. and different modes of thinking or engaging our brain different ways are associated with different eye movements. Right. And they drew up a model called the eye accessing cues. Mm -hmm. And the model that has become most famous was really just an example, which said that if you're thinking of a visual memory, you're looking upwards. If right. you think of an auditory memory, you look to the side and so on. And in that, it also had that if you are making up a visual memory as you go along, if you're fantasizing, you are looking in one direction. And if you're thinking of something that you actually have been through, you think in, uh, look in the other direction. And from that, it became everyone who's, lo who's lying is looking up to the right, uh, which is not what they said. <laughs> All 
the only thing they meant, as I understood it, was that most of us have some sort of system to this. If you do look upwards when you think about visual memories, mm -hmm. you tend to do that most of the time as you when you think of visual memories. They didn't say everyone looks upwards when they think of visual memories. That was just an example. Uh, what they did say was that we are congruent in our behavior, but that could change from person to person. And right, so this was just based on observation. And today there's a lot of, uh, there has been quite a lot of research done uh, on this model, but, but as far as I found it, no one has actually, you know, really looked at whether that main assumption was right or not. People right. are just stuck with the, it's controversial. The, uh, it is yeah, controversial the, now. Uh, the lying bits of it. Uh, so, right. so, but but the way you can use it is that if you talk to a person, you can check whether they have a consistency in the right movements sure. by ask uh, controller questions. So you ask them to describe something for you and see how they move their eyes, and then they you ask them to tell you what someone told them and see if you can see a change in eye movement. Right. Then you ask the same kind of question again to see if they do that kind of eye movement again. If they do, well, then you know that at least for this person, I now know how he or she moves her eyes when he or she is accessing different mental states or thoughts. And that is, of course, can be invaluable in later discussions with that person because mm -hmm. you would know when they are thinking creatively or when they are accessing a memory or when they are dealing with emotions and maybe they don't want to show it to you. But you really have to, uh, it's really dependent on who the person is. There's no general rule. Right. I think that's an interesting one. There's another really popular one that has been spread out so widely and has mm -hmm. been denounced by the guy who created, but that's the 55387 rule. All right, right. Uh, yeah. by uh, Albert Moravian, yes. or Moravian, sorry. And essentially that one is that 55% of communication is nonverbal and it's like 7% is words. And that's yeah. not what he meant at no, all. He was all. talking about over the course of time, as you were communicating with somebody, how what you were reacting to, if things don't feel right, is they... Um, differential of body language. Yeah, and also he referred to a very specific experiment, which right. in a very controlled uh, environment in that particular setting, they actually at one point uh, reached those exact numbers, but that was just in that very controlled situation. That was, they were not meant to be a generalization, but that's the whole, that, this is one of the dangers, I think, with the whole body language, nonverbal communication business. It's such a it's such a holy grail. Mm -hmm. It's sort of ultimate shortcut to understand right. other people. So it's very easy for things like this to to get footing, uh, if that sure. is the expression, uh, because it sounds. I mean, imagine if that is true, how simple things would be, and then you forget that there will, of course, be situations where body language will account to almost zero percent. Mm -hmm. And there will be situations where the, it will be a hundred percent. Are you um, familiar with uh, Joe Navarro? Yes. And his works. I think he has a really. Actually, I think he actually, I have a quote from him on my book. Oh, good. Yeah. I have the audio. <laughs> right. Um, so it's, like, it's Joe Navarro and Darren Brown. Oh, is, fantastic. Well, yeah. If you're going to, if you're going to have quotes, get them, get them there. But he has, I think a, a great, model that really simplifies things, but really makes so much sense. And he talks about everything is a matter of comfort or discomfort. Yeah, right. Yeah, I love that. And I, I wanted to see, you know, what you thought about it and expand mm. because it, it makes just everything kind of fit so well. Like if somebody's comfortable, then they're talking freely, whatever else. If they're uncomfortable, things start to happen. Um, mm. Pacifying gestures, comforting, you know, different things they stiffen or who knows but it, it goes against I, the the flow i when, when i came across that i really really liked it at, at first i was a bit hang on this is a bit too simplistic but then i realized that no it's actually not but i i do think that uh yes comfort discomfort that's really all there is to it but 
it's also good to be aware of all the sure. small nuances. So if there is discomfort, then you will have a tool set on how to change that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, comfort and not comfort, comfort and discomfort, you might notice it, but that will not still give you any clue on how to change it. Right. Uh, well, and there's different different places you're using it, right? Because in yeah. body language, like if you're doing an interrogation, well, you're trying to track it. Okay, where are they uncomfortable and why? You may actually want to increase it. It, it depends. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you're, sure. But in negotiation, you're going to want to lessen it, I'm guessing. Yeah, I would guess so as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's interesting. I like how, and I feel like your viewpoint is more in how to react to things versus how to use these things. Is that a fair analogy? Well, yeah, um, I would say that, uh, so uh, a bit of background now. Uh, so the the only reason I became interested in, in the whole most subtle part of our communication is because I was very socially awkward as a child. I did not have this skill, and uh, which meant that I, I always felt a bit, you know, from on the outside and I got bullied quite a lot and it felt like everyone else had been handed a book which I didn't get on on you know social skills so I got very interested in all this from a very pragmatic point of view I just needed uh, a skill set for my own and so and I started looking theater and and then I looked at marketing and psychology and so on and much later on I found the I found the tools first and later on I found the theoretical frameworks that explain the tools. But so for me, the the interest has always been uh, the interaction, the interaction, not you taking control of it necessarily, but first being able to observe what is being communicated to you and how to adjust your own uh, mode of communication to fit that which you observe and to change it also if necessary. But it, it's not uh, it's not from a, a a point of view of I want to control this. It's more I need this to work, and we are at least two people in it. Well, you want to get along. You want to yeah, hang yeah. out with the other people at the party. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, very. That's exactly what it is. You know, uh, we're lonely. We want friends. That's a natural human condition, unless yeah, sure. you're a, a misanthrope. <laughs> but. Right. And I, and I thought of one part very early on, uh, I, of course, I had an agenda as, uh, as well that I, I wanted to uh, take revenge on my, my former bullies. Uh, um, but that very quickly went away. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I started to understand more about human behavior and what informs our actions and choices, uh, all that just went completely away. Have you, I, I'm going to sidetrack there. Have you met any of your bullies later in life or seen them? I have, yeah. And that was weird. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you because I, yeah. I'll tell you mine, and then you could tell me yours because I think it's a, a fascinating thing. I, I had a really bad bully. I mean, awful one, smashing my head against windows, stealing mm -hmm. the money every day, all that good stuff. And years later, I was working in a grocery store, and I saw somebody, and they just looked so familiar, but they looked horrible. Wow. They looked like essentially like a meth head whose life had just you know, rained all kinds of hell on them. And it, uh, it, it took me a while because I kept looking and, you know, just walking around because it was working and then it clicked who that was. And I felt nothing but pity. Mm. It, it took, I mean, it took all of the, um, you know, the anger, the hate, the rage, yep. everything I had into it. I was just like, Whoa, you know, it's like if anything taught me karma, I feel like that was it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I met two of them mm -hmm. and at, at different stages in my life. So the the bullying took part from wh when I was six years old up until I was uh, 12 years old, I think. Um, and then when, when I was 12. So, so in Sweden, the school system is you start school at when, when you're seven. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you're six, there's this sort of preschool class. And then you start school properly at seven. Uh, and then... Uh, then you go up to ninth, uh, ninth class, and then you go to what, what we call gymnasium when, when you're 16. Hmm. 
so and so the bullying took part from the preschool class up until uh, I was in my sixth year. Then I changed school for my seventh year, and that that's when it stopped. So so the, the, there was this one guy who was the most the driving force b- behind the bullying, and the bullying was sort of everyone was in on it. Th- there was p- maybe two f- two three guys who were the instigators, mm-hmm. but all all the all the guys at the entire school were, were sort of engaged in this thing. Uh, so I had basically the entire school against me, um, and so the last time I saw him, the, the really mean guy, and he was sort of even even at that young age. The rest of us, we just realized that he has a really tough time at home. Right. Uh, it's sort of shown for it. So, so we we sort of felt sorry for him actually as well. Even though we were only ten, we we got that that the, the he's going through some really hard stuff. So I met him again. I didn't see him. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I was twelve the last time I saw him, and the next time I saw him, I was uh, sixteen or seventeen at the the gymnasium. And he came up to me and uh, basically what, is, what he said was that, so that, look, now you're at a new school. If right. anyone here tries to pick on you, just come to me and mm. I'll beat the shit out of them because no one will touch you, all right? And yeah. I, don't, I don't know where that was coming from. It's just, well, thank you. I'm not, but all right. So that was weird. But I think that was his way of sort of saying, I'm sorry, I suppose. Hmm. But then something... More interesting happened when I was 25. Uh, I was at this uh, at this party, and I met this this guy, a couple of years older than me, and I'd never seen him before in my entire life. So I thought, and when we we said hi, he understood who I was, and he just broke down, and 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 I didn't understand why. It turned out that he was one of the guys who'd been bullying me, but he wasn't in my in my class, he was two classes above me. Mm. I didn't really know him. I just know that the, there was this guy who used to pull my pants down when we were on the schoolyard, sort of. Mm. And that was him. Uh, I had got completely forget forgot about that and about him. He had not. Mm. So he was, you know, very very uh, apologetic and, and wanted to to say how sorry he was. Uh, and I thought, we're fine. That was ten years ago. Now it's more than ten years. It's it's twelve years ago. Let's just let's forget it. It's fine. But he couldn't. So during the rest of the evening, he just became more and more drunk, more and more <laughs> apologetic. And at the end of the evening, he was just. It was like in a film. He was sat in a corner, blabbering about how sorry he was for what he did when we were kids. And I still had no idea who he was. To this day, I don't know who he was. <laughs> Well, I, I guess at least he had a conscience. I mean, I, I'm sure you were almost feeling pity for him. <laughs> for oh, definitely, yeah. And and a bit awkward as well. I just want to do, hey, I mean, we look at me. I'm fine. It's it's okay. Let's let's have a drink. Let's do something. Let's do something fun. And he couldn't he couldn't get past that. He was still stuck in in what happened when he was 12 when I was 10. Uh, and I felt so f- sorry for him because that must be that must be awful to not mm-hmm. be able to move on. Yeah, it's it's funny. I've um, I had somebody else on Robin Dreek, and he said something that re- really resonated with me, and I think it may be related to that. But his job with the FBI was to recruit assets, essentially spies. Mm-hmm. And he had mentioned how he has been working somebody to death and working him to death, and and he kind of was all like, "I'm this and this and this, and I'm going to do this and this," and and not making it about that other person but make it all about himself. And that person said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll show, you know, I'll be there. And they were supposed to meet, and the guy didn't show up. And his supervisor said to him, yeah, um, not surprising, you made it all about you. And he, you know, he, of course he felt down about it, and his supervisor said, but don't beat yourself up, because then that's all about you too. Mm. And in a weird way, your bully, I think, still hasn't fully developed himself in the sense that now he's still externalizing versus internalizing it. Woe is me. Oh my God. On and on and on. Maybe he has to get that next step of, okay, I'm sorry. What can I do for you? And I think it's, yeah. 
and I think it's also rooted in your your sense of self, probably, uh, because I mean the uh, as you say, don't don't beat yourself up about it because that is also about you. I mean, there's no people who are more narcissistic than the uh, the people who have a very poor sense of self because they get so neurotic. So every, everything has to be about them. Someone is angry over there. It's probably about me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's like, well, you know, you've you've worked 15 different jobs and every one of those jobs had this problem person, that problem person, this problem person, that you know yes. what's funny? There's only one commonality I can think of for all 15 yeah. jobs. I heard about this. Um, a friend of a friend uh, yeah. is getting divorced. Uh, and he, his wife was one of those people. She has had like 10 different jobs. And mm. every single one of those jobs had, had her boss has always been psychotic. Right. But. Guess what? Maybe it wasn't them. <laughs> yeah, it's like after so much time, you have to say maybe there's another factor. Let's step back. <laughs> there's one more, but it's so hard to. It's really hard to uh, to do that. I think when when you're in the oh, midst sure. of. Uh, sure. I was guilty of it. I had my very first relationship was a seven year old relationship, and it was quite awful. But uh, you know, I was a guy who thought I was going to die if she left me. Mm. So I kept clinging on to it. And um, and then it thankfully it ended. And I said, never again. And then I went to an, into another relationship, seven year long relationship, which was also quite awful. <laughs> and, and after those 14 years, you know, and that was also that was, I didn't have anything before that. So that was sort of my sole experience of relationships ever. Right, right. Those two. And said, so how? So and I started to think about what, what what's the what, what are the odds that I meet two crazy people that right. I can't get rid of, or could it have something to do about me? <laughs> I was actually the only one who was in both those relationships. And it's really hard to to get hold sure. of that. I think. And and it, it takes a lot of work to do that, especially mm -hmm. I especially with your childhood and what you're describing. I I sure. think that you're a pleaser and you probably were ready to leave the relationship maybe even before that point, but you didn't want to hurt the other person and you felt like you made a commitment. And so you were sticking it out. And yeah. And, and also no, but that is, you know, my, my, my biggest weakness is the, uh, the fear of being disliked. That, that is something that I'm actually, uh, if there's one thing that I'm consciously working on, uh, with myself at the moment, it, it's that that is okay. That not every, not everyone not everyone has to like everything I do. That it's fine, and I know that uh, my rational mind knows that sure. it has it has known that for the last twenty years, but my limbic system is still not quite sure. Well, you're an entertainer too, so it's, there's another factor yeah. that if I'm not entertain entertaining and liked, well, then nobody's gonna there won't be butts in the seat, and I don't have work, so it's probably a higher level with you in that too. Well, yeah, I suppose, but then again, I mean, an entertainer that everyone likes that's quite a bland entertainer, True. right? If if you want to be uh, unique and, yeah. and some special then also there needs to be people who do not enjoy what you're doing. Uh, True. It's, you know, it's in the definition of it. But but I'm still, every time I see someone write something bad on on uh, social media or something, I'm just, ah! <laughs> Actually, that's a perfect callback. Um, Seth Godin put it really well when he said, sometimes you have to find out who you are not for. Right, yeah. Because if yeah. you can't find out, you can't figure out, okay, what am I about? Who am I for? Sometimes you can find your way by saying, well, who am I not for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then go working against that. So I guess that's a positive <laughs> viewpoint of not. No, it is. And again, in a rational way, I know this. But <laughs> what is your thoughts? <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about the uh, elephant in the room or the disease in our hands, but... <laughs> Essentially, you wrote an article recently, which of course is in Swedish, mm -hmm. but um, I would love to have you talk about it since I didn't get to read the article. Yeah, and I saw some 
translated actually recently, I think on LinkedIn, perhaps so somewhere. I don't know, but yeah. Awesome. You, you, you wrote that there are currently two viruses, a biological virus and a thought virus. Yeah. The latter two must be dealt with immediately. Talk us through it yeah. because this is important. Right. So, well, actually both of them, I think. And, and you know what, since this, this small article got somewhat misunderstood by people who wanted to misunderstand it, I will actually bring it up now on my phone. So I'll make sure to, to uh, cite it properly and not make anything up because it is such a tricky area. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least uh, also what, what you have to understand uh, in the context of this is that Sweden is doing, first of all, we're quite, we're not, you know, uh, we're faring quite okay in this mm -hmm. pandemic. We're not that hurt. Right. Uh, also, uh, it, I mean, if if it would have been in Sweden, as in Italy, for instance, things are, would be a, a, in a different way. But the thing is also that we have uh, our um, the agencies working for the the government mm -hmm. are uh, placing us on a path which is not the same one as most other countries. Our measures are quite different from what mm -hmm. most other countries are doing. And and I think we're we're doing fine. So the uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm just reading the article now. <laughs> so so the the thought virus was basically that what happened in Sweden was that people started to act as if the world was going to end mm -hmm. uh, immediately, which meant that they made decisions that in a best case scenario were just a bit you know. Uh, cute and, and laughable and in a worst case scenario could really really hurt uh, the uh, society at large and and they were of course based on on fear and a knowledge or rather the uh, absence of knowledge and citing rumors and so on so, mm -hmm. so that's what i wanted to write about that this is going on now we have to understand what it is and and what it does to us so we can behave as adults uh because first of all we have the fear of the unknown of course sure and uh, the problem with the fear of the unknown is that today i mean in this pandemic there's very little or at least a couple of weeks back when i wrote this the uh there were very little facts to go on and there were facts that were uh, you know counter uh, we didn't know really what, what to believe or not. Mm -hmm. And with social media, uh, there is no friction in the uh, deliverance of, of information, which meant that there was enough time to to stop and think about, does this, does, is this plausible or not? You can right. just fall information at, at, uh, immediately, which meant, of course, that the the spread of information which earlier uh, used to be sort of controlled and or sure. a radio address every day or something yeah, of that sort. Exactly, had no control whatsoever, um, and that is a problem in itself because our minds work in a way that if you hear something being repeated, this is why polit politicians do it all the time. If you hear something being repeated, mm -hmm. after a while you tend to think that it's true because you hear it all the time. And here's the quirky part of it. Uh, your mind makes no dis distinction between whether it's 50 people saying one thing or if it's one guy saying something 50 times. Mm. We still have this notion of, yeah, I hear this all the time. So that is really, really dangerous in a context like this, of course, when there's so much misinformation and disinformation going around. That way, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I heard that too. Right. Well, actually, it might have been from just the same guy. And then things start to become truths. Joseph uh, just Goebbels. Repetition and <laughs> and repetition in social media. Um, and also, I think it's sort of... Uh, and the things we do, we humans, when we uh, when we don't know how to behave in, in, a, in a new setting is that we, we look to our surroundings, what is everyone else doing, uh, the right. spectator effect. And unfortunately, we have seen so many films, I think now, how to handle a, uh, a catastrophic event, 
we know that we're supposed to go out and loot the uh, the nearest shop for toilet paper, whatever. Mm, so like toilet seats and all that good stuff. Yeah, so people start doing it, and the rest of them go, oh, so that's what we're supposed to do. So this sort of very dangerous behavior uh, snowballs because we don't know what to do, so we do what just everyone else is doing. And again, you need to stop and think about is this a, is this behavior hurtful now? Uh, because I mean, if if everyone is buying up all the toilet paper, you will create or whatever it is, you will create right. a black market, and the distribution system for the stores will collapse. Maybe we shouldn't do that uh, because there's so much ripples. Everything sure. we do now creates ripples, ripples that will be with us for a long time to come. Yeah, I worry. I worry that the cure is worse than the uh, disease at this point. I, yeah. I mean, the the economic ramifications will be felt for decades. They will. They will. It's. Uh, I mean, even even in Sweden, again, our measurements are. Or, sorry, our measures are quite uh, discreet. Mm-hmm. But still, I mean, we have already we have tens of thousands of people who have lost their jobs, right. uh, personal tragedies, uh, uh, people filing for bankruptcy, uh, and well, and just that- yourself. All of your um, shows are canceled for a while, right? Sure, sure. I have no work at the moment, uh, and I mean, but I'm I'm all right. I can still pay my rent. Right. I. I try to, when I go out in town, I, I talk to people who work in shops and so on and say, if you need to close tomorrow, mm-hmm. uh, how long can you survive? And I've found that, at least in Stockholm, where I live, most young people, they have saved up enough so they can pay one more rent. That's it. Mm-hmm. So it might also create a lot of homelessness. Uh, and if we get into a recession because of this, that will be very hard to turn around. Oh, yeah. So, uh, as you say, the, the price will be immense. Also, the isolation. I That's worry about great. mental health, that there yeah. are some people who absolutely need contact and they may be on the spectrum and we can have other, you know, deaths from that. Yeah, uh, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually see suicides because of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and here's the thing. I'm really annoyed about the term social distancing. I hate sure. it's not social distancing that we should be doing physical distancing. Right. Yeah. I'm but with social you. embracing. Absolutely. Social. Yeah. No, we need to be more social. We need to take care of each other even more because now uh, in Europe, there's a lot of countries closing the borders. Right. Uh, which is a silly decision, according to me, because if you have the infection already in your country, closing the border won't do any won't change anything. Mm-hmm. Unless, of course, you tend to keep them closed because then you can get rid of the, the infection in your country. But as soon as you open them up, you might get it back, right? Mm-hmm. And and what, what a lot of people don't know that in many countries which have closed their borders, their own um, pandemic institutes mm-hmm. have actually uh, advanced, advised against it. There's mm-hmm. no point do not do it. It will only create a very difficult environment. Uh, but... You have a lot of politicians. They need to be seen to do something. Right. Closing the border is a very symbolic, it's a very powerful gesture, uh, but it means nothing. So there's a lot of politics involved in this as well, sure. which you have to understand. Oh, and absolutely. At the same time, people are dying. We have to acknowledge this. It Not as very scary. The seasonal flu, granted, yet, yeah, but um, so uh, so I think we really people have to first of all. As much as you can to get back on the thought virus, to the way to combat that, first of all, get as much of the fact as a fact as you possibly can. Always fact check. Who said this? Who are the, what are those credentials? Mm-hmm. Do not believe in stuff because just be, because they're getting repeated all the time. Um, do not believe the papers or the tabloids. Fact check them as well because they want you know uh, to t- sell advertisement. And also, we should uh, be okay with the fact that we won't be able to know everything, that there is the unknown, and that is fine. Right. Uh, because that's another big fear we have, of course, the fear of the that we, which we cannot know ever. And you have to be okay with that. 
and not rush headlong into uh, very short-sighted decisions that in the long run could have very bad consequences just because you didn't know what was going to happen. But that's fine. Life is sort of like that anyway. Totally agree. And to keep it on a dark note, no. <laughs> I want to wrap up and just talk a little bit about, you have a book coming up this fall, yeah. um, The Art of Social Excellence, or How to Make Your Personal and Business Relationships Thrive. Yes. And you also have a series of videos on YouTube that I mm -hmm. discovered, which are social super skills. Are those related to the book coming up? They are, yeah. So what happened was, uh, first I wrote the book, The Art of Reading Minds, which was out last November. Mm -hmm. And in that book, I sort of wanted to deal with all the aspects of communication that we don't normally think about, the nonverbal part of it, the subconscious part of it, and how that affects our relationships uh, and behavior in general. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the art of social uh, the art of social excellence is sort of the flip side of that, which was I want to take a uh, to write something where. If you have a social situation coming up, it could be anything. It could be, you know, you're going out uh, with some friends on a Friday night, or it could be an intense negotiation setting at work, whatever it is, and you feel a bit, I don't know how to handle this. I wanted to provide you with those tools, whether mm -hmm. they be uh, subconscious or, or nonverbal or not. Right. And since I am very pragmatic and I'm very tool oriented, I created a challenge for myself to be able to explain at least some of these tools, 10 or 20 of them in less than 60 seconds. Uh, so that was the, so that YouTube series was, was originally meant for, for Instagram. Hmm. For sort of, here's a social super skill, a tool that you can go out and use and it won't even take me 60, 60 seconds to explain it to you in a way that we, you will benefit from hopefully for the rest of your life. Uh, and then, of course, in the book, I delve much deeper into the nuances of it. And I mean, the the tools in the YouTube series are by necessity because of a time constraint are very, you know, uh, well, short and brief. Sure. But the, I hope the book is very uh, oh, nuanced uh, and will give you everything you need. Well, awesome. I wanted to bring it up, too, because I would love to have you come on to my live stream and open this up to the audience. Right. And maybe as a framework, we can use these social super skills kind of in between people's questions to sort of have a nice through line. And I wanted to ask if you'd be up for that in the next couple of weeks. I would love to, yeah. Well, excellent. Well, we're going to put a pin in that. And people can find you where? Right. Uh, so people can find me in social media. I'm at Twitter, but I constantly forget to check my Twitter feed. So best way to find me is actually on Instagram or Facebook. Okay. And where I am Henrik Fexius. Exactly. Okay. And you'll have to look at the show title to get the spelling. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, because the spelling is, is weird, uh, I suppose, especially for you guys in the in the US. Right. It's perfectly normal for you guys, I'm sure. No, it's well different. actually it's not. Well Henrik is easy, is he Henrik with a K. Uh, my surname, however, is actually a made up name. So no one knows how to spell it. Okay. Well, at least you had fun with it. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me.